Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about um, generally how to get data out of Dishes 2, but also a little bit about uh, the team integration we have with me, Bob, and a few others. Um, and we're going to kind of give an introduction to what, what we've been up to and, and kind of um, it's, it's a little bit repeat from last year, but we also have some additional things. And, and we even had two use cases uh, that we were presenting. Uh, and so are you here? Uh, so he's not here yet, but he will be coming soon. And then we have it from hopefully, and then we have to topic will also present uh, Indonesia uh, the case. Okay. Yeah, so this basically we're very, very quickly going to give an overview of some of the um, APIs available for DHS2. Um, introduction, quick, quick introduction to our Java SDK and kind of what's the purpose of it. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about a project camel component we have made and a couple of use cases um, on top of that. Um, these are quite simple examples, but they kind of give you an introduction to it. And, and uh, later we will see a bit more complex example. Um, but there is also multiple examples in our uh, GitHub repository if you want to see that. And of course, we're going to talk, as I said, and so we'll talk a little bit about. Um, some fire integration we have done in Latin America um, through the PAHO um, for um, SRVs or AFI, which is similar but not the same, um, and the custom fire profile they have made. And then um, Tofik, as I said, he will int introduce a, a system they have created in Indonesia uh, for also doing fire integration and a few other, few other things, but he will show that later. And at the very end, we're going to talk a little bit about the roadmap for team integration and what, what kind of what we are planning to do in the next year or few, few, few years. So this is the team, um, Bob Jolliffe sitting there. He's what we call the, the product, product lead. Uh, we call him as of the technical lead. I don't know, these roles are not uh, set in stone, uh, but that's what we call calling us. Uh, and we have Claude Mama, which is not here, but he's in, um, in Malta. Uh, doing some, some coding for us there. So he's, he's a full-time um, integration engineer working for us. Uh, he's been working on the stuff I'm going to present today, the Java SDK, and also the Apache Karma component, and, and a few real-world implementations of using that. Uh, we also have a Bob calling it the junior integration engineer. I don't know if you see here in the room. Yes, that's behind there. That's the Yuan. So he's working for Dev Otta. So he, he will also, he's also joining us a little bit from time to time. That's uh, very nice. We need more people, definitely. So that's uh, very good. And then we have, I think we just mentioned a couple of people here, but they are, we have this weekly call, the integration call, and maybe some of you are all already on that call. I think we have just a fit set about 15 invites or something. If you want to be part of that weekly meeting, please just let us know and we can add you to that calendar invite. And it's, it's very open um, and we have some, um, we also send out some emails from time to time with kind of the upcoming projects. <clears throat> so, and I just done I, this. What we want to read a bit about what we are doing. Uh, there's a couple of links here. Uh, one is to just give us a general overview of the integration and what we've been doing, and uh, links to a few projects. <clears throat> and the other one is uh, Fire, kind of the current standing. I think we call it DHS2 on Fire. Um, but that's going to give us a little bit of a view of uh, the current status of DHS2 and, and Fire. And that's something we are definitely build, building on. And we will talk a little bit about that later. So, yeah. So, just going to mention I'm sure you, most of you guys will know, 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 know this already. So, there won't be any kind of examples necessarily of that. But these are kind of the three main um, APIs we have in DHS2. <clears throat> we have, of course, the metadata API. And, and I've given lots of links there, so you can kind of, when you get the slides, you can kind of click on those links and it will take you directly to the documentation. Um, of course, the metadata is kind of the building block of DCS2. Um, so that's data elements, org units, and, you know, programs and data sets and all that stuff. Uh, we have a full set of APIs for that. And everything you can do in any of your apps is done through the API. So the metadata API. So the maintenance app, for example, is only using the same APIs as, as, as you can be using. Uh, it does support a few different features. We are kind of, kind of not going to go into that now, but we, we will see a couple of practical examples of that later when we are going to get some data out of these two. Um, kind of the two big ones for metadata is filtering of uh, the object filtering or searching for particular ob objects that might be a particular code or UID or a name. So it starts with this name, for example, and so on. 
and it has uh, what's called the field filtering. So basically allows you to select exactly um, the, the, the payload you want to get out, out of it. Um, <clears throat> other than that, of course, we have the aggregate API. So the aggregate API is, um, well, for aggregates. So whenever you go into the data entry app, that's also using the, the, the aggregate API. So that allows you to send in both single value updates, but also full data value sets, which is kind of having, um, <clears throat> sorry, my, my throat is not great, great today. Um, so if you have, um, yeah, so you have all kinds of data, you, you, can, you can see that later maybe, but uh, but it's basically giving you a way of sending in aggregate data. So if, um, there's links for it there, and then you can go in and, uh, and uh, look at it yourself. And I think, um, feel free to, 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 I put the email on the first slide. So if you have any questions about any of these APIs or you're struggling, so please, please just contact us. <clears throat> and of course, the latest, uh, the last one, is the, the tracker API. Um, and that's, of course, what, what, what a lot of people have been using lately. And it's probably very, very something that you're definitely going to be working with if you're going to do any kind of fire integration, for example. It's more about patient data. Um, and kind of the big thing now is that we have two tracker importers. Um, actually, we had it for many years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we've been calling it a new importer for the last five years, I think. So yeah, long stuff. Okay, okay, just a tracker importer. <laughs> exactly, the new new one. <laughs> so so yeah, so uh, I don't know if it's right calling the other one legacy, but that's that's kind of what I, what I, what I selected there. But uh, but that's kind of a big big deal because that's a completely new API. But luckily, it's the domain object themselves look more or less the same. There's a few changes here and there, but this should be a relatively simple upgrade job, I think. And it should be a lot quicker, hopefully. And that's, uh, <laughs> that's on you. <laughs> so, that, so that's a much, much more robust um, importer. I don't know, in, we've saved 40, right? I think we say 40 is the one we kind of call it production ready. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, What's your question? Or? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Anyways, so so this is kind of important to know because if you're starting an integration today, uh, and you're going to keep that going for a few years, you might be targeting 238 today. But you know, if you're going to keep that going for the next couple of years, you might want to also actually target version 40. And uh, it is not much difference, but the bigger difference from the outside is that the the the, the, um, the responses is much more model like the metadata importer. So you know you can get the ex more exact um, errors and so on. So so that should be very interesting. Um, so definitely something to to look into. So what do we do in these two and integration? Like what what is our stack? So. You've probably seen this before if you've been to any of our other presentations. We've been using this for a while now, and it hasn't really changed. Um, so, kind of the, the, the core of it is Java, as DSHS2 itself is Java. This was a natural fit. Uh, we have been playing around with other things in the past, but we kind of stuck now with, with Java. Um, and it's using Spring Boot, which is a very common framework these days. Um, if you have done any Java development lately, you probably have heard about Spring Boot. It kind of takes the Spring framework and kind of packages it very nicely, allows you to create things small, executable uh, Java files. And then, of course, Apache Camel, uh, which is an implementation of what's called the enterprise integration patterns. But it's basically an integration engine that has, I don't know how many hundreds of components, but it has a lot of components. That allows you to talk to Telegram, talk to Twitter, um, pull data from from HTTP, and allows to all, do all kind of stuff. And that framework is extensible, so this is where our own component comes in. So we kind of made it easier to work with DHS2, um, and we'll see that later. That's kind of the so we kind of uh, just using the the framework that Camel gives us basically to to implement our own um, what's called an, an endpoint. Um, we have been playing around with a little bit of um, mapping languages. Uh, I think we're kind of sticking with data sonnet, at least for now. Um, so either we're doing it in Java or in data sonnet. And data sonnet is just a language for doing, um, well, JSON to JSON transformations. Um, it's, a, it's a neat little language, um, but it, it, it has some, uh, yeah, it has some limitations. So sometimes, actually, what we'll show today is only using Java. 
Um, but this definitely is something we have been using. I think for an entire Rapid Pro project, we have been using only data sonnet. Um, so that's also something you can look into if you want. Um, but there's no, there's no requirement from our side for that. We kind of just give you a few building blocks for talking to DCS2 and, and kind of doing that a bit more elegantly. But data sonnet is something that you can add to it yourself. And of course, Camel has a component for data sonnet, so it's kind of neatly packaged together. Um, Actually, MQ is again not a requirement. It's just one of those things that are part of the stack. We use it, I think, in Rapid Four. We don't have using it still there. I'm not sure, um, but we have been using it from time to time, and it's it's kind of a nice little um, queuing system. Um, it's, it's very easy to to embed in Camel, or you can kind of set up your standalone. And this is actually what we're also using in DHS too, if you know that. Um, the, in, internally, we're using actually Active MQ Artemis for audits. And now in 240 or 40, um, we also support what's called the event hooks. And that again, that's also supporting uh, Active MQ. So that's something that's now supported. And we're not going to go through that today. I think maybe Austin has a session about that. But uh, um, but yeah, um, but that's something important to know. Um, so does does this look familiar to people who have done job development? Is it is it, is it completely fresh or is it? Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, if you, if you are Java developer, at least this should be a very common common things to work with. Um, we do have a little bit of Java coming later. Uh, I will try not to do too much of that because I don't think that's the most interesting part of this. We have a, we want to spend some time on the use cases. So what is the Java SDK? Well, it, it's um, it's basically just a wrapper around HTTP requests and allowing you to talk to DHS too. Um, it allows you to kind of do set up me some basic authentication. Like the create what's called a DSR2 client, and a DSR2 client will then contain um, the the username, password, uh, or maybe the path if you're using a, the the pattern access, um, sorry, personal access token. Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, and one thing that's kind of neat. Um, so this is, as you can see here, it's a bit specific, but you're actually auto generating. Um, the, the domain model of DHS2. So we, 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 have, we are not taking out the model of DHS2, but we are kind of regenerating it um, in our own system um, using some scripts we have made. Um, and that allows you to basically, instead of creating kind of your own classes for this, you can just take this class that already exists in the SDK and you can just get an organization unit and then you have that full data. And you can say, is name uh, present, is uh, ID present, and so on. And then you can just get those values. Um, so that kind of helps you a bit. Um, we'll probably change this on soon to be version 40 only and not have dot one, dot two, and so on, because it doesn't really make sense. So we're gonna clean that up a bit. Um, and we have actually, I know Claude is working on, I'm not sure if he's fully finished, but if Claude is also working on um, a way of generating this using the only open API specification. Has anyone seen or heard about open API? Yeah, I see some here. Uh, so, so that's something we, that's coming now in 2.40 or version 40. Uh, we're gi giving you kind of the full open API spec for the entire system uh, that's been auto generated and also published on our do documentation site. So that's something that's very interesting. And so, so before we, we were kind of <clears throat> looking into the, 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 the objects or the Java class themselves, but now we are just taking that specification from open API and generating this, um, this uh, do domain classes. And of course, we have the, the camel component is kind of this, the more interesting part. Um, <clears throat> so that's, of course, using the Java SDK for uh, all the interactions with, uh, with the DHS2. And you will see it's specifying the actual client. And we will again see that very soon, how do you, you create those. Um, it, has, so it has a few endpoints that you can use, but, um, or a few um, operations. Uh, I'm just showing you a couple here, where you're just getting an object. Um, so there's two ways of getting an object. You could get what's called a collection, and that will give you an iterable. And this will be if you can, if you're getting, for example, um, organization units, you can kind of iterate through them one by one in, instead of just getting all of them. Um, but if you're doing the resource, you will get the whole the full thing. And we'll be using a resource today, and we'll see that later. And of course, we have the fields. This maps to the field filtering we already have in DHS2. Uh, and then when you then 
if you're using this uh, this endpoint, and if you're targeting one of these auto-generated classes, it will just automatically populate them. No time. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. So this, so this will be Java code, of course. So I'm sorry if not everybody will understand it, but the point is, I'm just going to quickly show you how to create these this clients. Um, if you ever use the Happy Fire client library, this will look probably similar for you. So you basically have a client builder, you're creating a new client, and then you just give it the base URL, this including slash API, just to be aware of that, and then the username and the password. In this case, I just created uh, two, two uh, one source and one target, and I'm just going to link them together. And then I have, let's see here. So all this code is linked from the slides. So you can, this is all, all available. And of course we have a very, very simple uh, definition of it here where you're just linking to the our dev server and uh, the latest 239 and that would be the target. So, so in this case, it will just take the ordinates from 239, sorry, from dev and then put them into 239. They are the same, but you make some, you will make some modifications and add, add, add some ordinates and you will see how they are reflected in, in both, or both of the systems. So, <laughs> so again, this is some Java code, sorry for that. But uh, so this is how you define routes in Camel. Um, the actual route that does something interesting is this one. So I will see this one. So this will be reading organization units from DHS2. Uh, we're turning off paging, so we get all of them. And then we're selecting the specific fields that we want to use. And uh, as you see, we're using the resource we saw before, and we are targeting the organization units, and we are using the digital to client source, which is kind of the, the that was the, the dev server, right? And then we are marshaling into the metadata class, which is kind of a, it's an object that contains all the, the classes of DHS2 basically. So it has collections for organization units, for data elements, and for all of these things. So this allows you kind of to wrap that into a in very neat, neat little package. Um, and feel free to ask questions if there's any. Um, then we have a very simple target. And we don't really need to do much because now that we are read in these things, and that metadata is already in what we call the body. So you basically can write uh, the DHS2 the, the without kind of giving it more. It, it already understands that um, the data is going to send is in, in the body. So and again, you are using another target. And <clears throat> as a just for, for showing for some next example, we're also exposing two web endpoints. Uh, the one is just uh, OU, which is just gives you the organization units directly in, in the browser, but through Camel. So when it triggered to that endpoint, it will go to the, the source, this is two, and then present them to you in, in, the, in the browser. And, it is, and then we have one where we can trigger a sync. So what we do now, and it's starting that, that route, on startup, we will trigger it once uh, just to get the get an initial sync. Uh, of course, here we could have a timer that did this every hour or so. Or so, but in this case, we're just exposing it as a trigger instead. Uh, just a different way of doing it. That's kind of up to you. It depends on the use case and so on. And maybe you will have a bash script or a cron job or something that will do that triggering for you. And again, that's, that's it. So it's a very simple example. But it shows in not many lines, about 50 lines or something, that you can read from the dishes to transform it, 
send it back to another DHS2, um, and then even exposing the, the web endpoints, right? So this is a very simple way of doing this. It's a very simple code, hopefully, um, but it sort of shows you the, the, the power of Camel and, and what is possible there. So let me just log in here. Yeah, so then we have two, two instances, you see, and this is the, the one, and this is the 239 one. So well, what will happen now, it will use dev as the source, and it will take all those organets and send them to the 239 instance. So let's start it up. So now it's started up. It's doing an initial sync internally, um, but now the, the, the organisms are the same on both sides, so it's, this doesn't really doing much. Um, so let's try to add a new one. Sorry for doing this directly on the dev server, but that's fine. Right, so these are just the required properties of, um, of the organization unit. You need to have the, the test or the, the name and the, and the short name and then the start update. So now we have another one called test here, but of course, now this one is just standing there, right? You can imagine having this on the server and the Docker container or the LXC container, and it's kind of sitting there waiting for you to, to interact with it. So now what you need to do now is to, if you go up for here, I have a little sheet sheet. So now we will trigger, and you see what's interesting now is, it's even giving us the response from DHS2. Because this is not DHS2. This is actually going through Camel, talking to DHS2, and then coming back with kind of the, the import report. You will see it created one, which makes sense, and then updated everything else. And now if you go back to back to the 239.2, refresh, you will see that we have the test there, right? So this is how you can very easily automate that sync process. And we will talk a little bit about this on the roadmap, but we are actually gonna and make this into a synchronization product at some point where you can kind of synchronize multiple data to instances, um, not only organization units, but also other, other type of data. So any questions about this? The code is available, as I said, if you want to have a look at it and, and play around with it. Um, <clears throat> Yes, yes. So it's using the, the DHS2 client that we created and then using the, so if you go back to the code. Hmm. Yeah. Josh, okay, okay. Oh, so, so, okay, so I just want to repeat the question. Um, so the question is, is it going to the database or is it going to the web API, right? Yeah, so in this case, it's definitely going to the web API. Of course, you probably don't even want to have this on the same instance that you have DHS2. So this is all using the, the, the API. Um, so that's why you're setting up you're setting up the source and the target using HTTP, you don't have the URL of the server. Uh, so, so that's uh, that, that definitely doing that. Yes, yes, yes. We are only using stuff that you're already using in DHS2. Uh, so there's no magic really happening here. It's just, it's just you can think of it as a wrapper for HTTP requests, basically. I mean, it, it does more than that, but that, that's at a really sim simple level. You can look, look, at it, look at it like that. And the same way you would go to your browser and go um, play dev slash organization units, and then you put patient files or fields. This, this is basically what it's doing for you uh, behind the scene, doing exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> we definitely could. Oh, so. So Camel, of course, has components also for Postgres and SQL in general. Uh, so that's definitely something you can do. Of course, then you probably don't want that remote. You want something maybe living on the same server um, because, because of security and everything, but, uh, but that's definitely possible. 
and that, that's because DHSG is one thing, but maybe you have another database, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, of course you, can, you can imagine pulling from the analytical tables, for example. And if you're pulling a lot of data, it might be a lot quicker to just do that through SQL directly. And but you can use a camera anyways, and then you can wrap that into a nice object and then you can send that to somewhere else or whatever you want to do with that. Yeah, so that's the, that's definitely possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay, so yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, just to, there was a long, long, long question. <laughs> um, so, so basically, you want to use GraphQL to query DHS two? Is that what you're saying? Hmm. Yes, yeah, so the question is, can you set up Camel in a way that it acts as a facade of DHS2, but it's, but it's providing a GraphQL at the view? Yeah, that, that's definitely possible. I'm pretty sure, Bob, that Camel has GraphQL components. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you basically, so basically you do that, that you do, do from, um, well, actually, it's probably similar to, I wouldn't be surprised if it's quite similar to this one, that we have the rest, that it has something similar for GraphQL, uh, where you basically can expose it. You might have to do some bit of processing on the data because it's not the same, of course. So you have to translate that. And you will see an example of that um, in, the, in the next example, where we transfer from DHS2 and we convert it to fire format. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely something you can do. And it's a very common thing to do, actually. And, and one, one of the things we have done uh, with some of our other projects is that we have actually exposed the, the, the web interface, uh, which provides you with fire, but actually it's actually pulling from DHS2. And you can do the same with GraphQL where you kind of expose the GraphQL and you can even talk to three different DHS2 instances and give them all data from this three. That's definitely possible. That definitely, it's kind of the stuff is made to do. Uh, yeah, so that's the 100% possible, yeah. So let me close down this one. Um, Also going to show you a very similar example, but this time we're going to do some mapping of the data. So we're going to transform um, the organization units to a very simple representation of fire using location and organization, uh, which is kind of the way they represent uh, health, health facilities and so on. Let's see. Um, I'm just gonna close on this one. So um, everything here, except for this one, everything else is the same. So this is the same project, same setting up the source and everything. But there's a little bit, there's small, small differences, but uh, that you can look at yourself. And we're kind of setting up the same thing here. We're doing an in initial sync, and then we're also exposing it through a trigger. And before, so you see that it's very, very much the same. <clears throat> what really has changed here now, you see, I do a little bit of the ordering and so on, but that's just normal DHS2. Um, and I'm just doing level two. So I did one and two. Um, no, no paging, but you don't even need paging here because it's not that many. And then we are reading from DHS2, the source. Again, that's the play dev. And we're doing the same here where we are, um, Unmarshalling using metadata. And the new thing here is now as we're converting the body. So, this is basically um, a way of taking one format and uploading another format. And we will, of course, look into that class to see how, how it does it. The rest is pretty standard. Um, it's actually using, so Fire themselves have also created a component for Camel. As I said, we have, there are many, many, many components. For, several hundred. 
So here we are actually sending all of those organization units to fire. So we start up a, a fire server in the background, um, and then we will uh, basically send it to there. Um, and of course, we do the same same thing as before. We are exposing it as an API. Uh, so this is just a typical uh, fire and endpoints, uh, just calling it um, base R4 bundle. Um, but it could call it whatever you want. And then we have another one for the triggering of that. So given the time, I should, don't, don't want to go through too much details, but we'll show it actually how it's working. And I need to find, okay. So this is how you run uh, Happy Fire in Docker. It's a very, very nice way of running it actually. Uh, they have their own the Happy Fire jar file you can also download, but this is kind of the preferred way of doing it honestly. Um, so who knows fire here? Is that something people have been looking into? Yeah, I see more hands raised that than for Java. <laughs> so so fire is kind of the new hot stuff, right? So it's when they're doing a health in, in, in instability, fire is, is something that people talk about. <laughs> I will show you. I will show you. I will show you. So before I run it, I will actually show that. Um, so as I said, this is more or less the same, but we do have something new. And this is, is what's called a type converter in, in, a, in, in, in a common speak. So what we're doing, we are basically, if you know fire, how the JSON, the payloads are constructed, we're basically taking uh, the happy fire client library and we're kind of creating them um, so this is why I like using Java in this case, because we know that the, the, the JSON representation will be correct, right? Because it's using the Happy Fire uh, li libraries itself. Um, you could, of course, use data on it. And I think we even have examples of that uh, from last year, from the, 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 the annual conference 2022. I think we still have those online. We probably we have sort of slides for it also. Um, but again, depending on your complexity, it might make sense or not make sense to use another tool. And there are, of course, more than data on it. There must many, many tools out there. You can also use JavaScript if you want. I mean, that's really up to you. But I, I, in this case, I'm using Java. So <clears throat> not going to go into the fire details here, but this basically constructing this entire object now, and you end up with a bundle. That's what they call it in, uh, in the fire, which just contains all the locations and all the organizations. And, and, how, and they are linked, linked together. And we are using um, so when we are adding this, we are doing a put and not a post. This allows you to send the same multiple times. So in the case we are doing uh, a searching for the identifier here, and then if it exists, they will uh, just update it. And then also create the location. So so that's kind of the, how they they represent it. And you will see here. <coughs> I, I talked about this generated um, um, domain objects, right? So you will see here that this organization unit is actually using the organization unit class that we have generated. It allows you to, to get code in this case, and you will return an optional, and you can just check if that value is present or, present or not. That allows you to kind of do conditional mapping depending on what's there. Okay, so let's run it. So again, it kind of does the same as before. So it will run it once at startup. So let me just open up this. And oh. So this is our fire server. It's up and running on port 8081. Um, <clears throat> and you can you can see here if you go to Location. Oh, okay. You see, if you do search, <clears throat> it can be a bit slow sometimes. You see, there's absolutely not, nothing here because I haven't done anything yet. So, this is a completely empty fire server. We go back here, you see that it's set up, but let's go in here. And you can Starting up again. So what's happening now? It's going to teach us to. It's getting those 
um, organization units. And now it's done. He's done the initial sync already. Uh, we can just confirm that. It's sometimes it takes a while for it to show up. Um, oh, or maybe I don't do the initial sync here. Sorry. Okay, let's just go to the trigger triggering. So th this time the, the endpoint is fire first trigger. And you have to do fire organization. You will see here. You can do. Oh. Yeah, here you will see we have all the uh, the location from DHS to Sierra Leone and tests that we made before, and a few other ones that's kind of of the level one and two of DHS two. Um, so this is very simple, simple. but we, what we have done is kind of complex, right? We've we gone to DHS2, we've gotten a, a huge payload of organizations. We took them into Camel. We have converted it completely to different formats. Then we have sent it to Fire Server, right? Very typical use case, very typical, something that you, you, you will be doing probably a lot if you're going to use Camel. It's just a, so it's a very nice, nice way of doing it. And uh, this is also a kind of our general approach to our Fire integrations. Uh, and we will see also the power use case, um, which I will switch over to very, very soon now, that we are using um, Java, um, Java for everything. We're constructing all the objects in Java, uh, which kind of get a bit messy, um, but definitely that can data some get also. So that's just how, how it is. Okay, just close down this one. Okay, so now we have Enzo. Time for Enzo. He will uh, present a little bit of background information about the Power SRV. Uh, this is the first of two use case presentations. Uh, so he will just start it. Should I practice how to use the microphone first? There we go. Thank you, Martin. You're so popular. You have people sitting on the floor. There's a couple of seats here. I see one there and one up there. If you want to join, also one here, because that was that was a hard floor. <laughs> so feel free to move. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the you know what Morton is actually talking about because that's why we have him around. But I'll tell you a little bit about what the Paho Esavi use case is. And when I'm talking about Esavi, I'm talking essentially about AEFI uh focus on the Pajo region there's uh with the new COVID vaccines you know things were getting approved a lot quicker uh there was a lot of skepticism amongst the public so there was a higher focus on vaccine safety and vaccine surveillance and making sure that these vaccines were safe and good for the population and to just keep the public at ease that they were doing their best they could to kind of look after these things and already when looking at the manual for how AFI was process in the region we have one initial very clear difference just the name uh, in most of the world we talk about AFI adverse event following immunization already in the Americas and um, for those of you who don't know PAHO is the Pan American Health Organization they are essentially both their own organization looking at health in the Americas but also the the WHO for the Americas as well uh, so the name for AFI there is events supposedly attributable to vaccination or immunization. So already in the name, we have some differences, and there are a few other differences in the actual guidelines, but mainly they are based on the WHO guidelines. Uh, the first thing they did was to go around the different countries and see what systems were in place for uh, for measuring and uh, looking at AFIs, and they found that 62% were taking everything on paper and then doing a transcription into a spreadsheet. So Excel is king as usual. Uh, but then they found that there were also a lot of isolated systems that were quite fragmented and a few centralized web-based systems out there. But in general, it was not looking great. Uh, so so Paho started a quite large project to, to work with this. And one of the components is, is DHS2, in particular for those countries who did not already have uh, a system of, of any kind. Uh, they divided the project a little bit into uh, 
on the one hand, we already have a metadata package for WHO following the the gener general guidelines for a AFI surveillance. So what we did is that we grabbed that package and we essentially adapted it to the to the guidelines from PAL, right? Uh, the 25 core variables that the AFI package has turned into 33. Uh, they included uh, standards in the package, which was a whole lot of things because you can't really include standards in something that you are publishing when a lot of these standards are actually proprietary and there are licenses, etc. So, so that complicated things a bit. But the main difference with the with the generic metadata package is those two things and the addition of an investigation stage. Uh, the WHO package assumed that when you were reporting an AFI, the investigation will happen elsewhere and will not be recorded in the HS2. Paho expected that to also be recorded there. So that increased the complexity. Uh, the investigation stage itself is longer than all of the other stages combined, I think. Uh, and after a while, we realized that it was it was it's a really big use case to go to a country and start from. So a lot of countries were a bit hesitant to start straight up getting generating their own national instance. So they essentially divided it into. On the one hand, they had active surveillance, which was looking into AFIs and AESI adverse events of special interest. So it's like a lot more data recording. Uh, and those were called a sentinel deployment. So we're have, they were having a few hospitals in like a lot of different countries who were doing this specialized active surveillance and were used as sentinel sites. And in addition, then they had the, the passive AFI surveillance. So that's for national deployments, which is essentially a, a metadata package based on the PAHO guidance, all right? Now, if you want to look at the difference between those two, uh, there's not a but between the national instance and the Sentinel one. Uh, here's the the main difference. Main difference is that each uh, rep each event that gets notified gets to be divided in whether it's an ESAVI or an adverse event following immunization or an adverse event of special interest, and then they get classified in the end depending on on the whole process and what happens in the investigation stage. Whilst the one that countries are required to use is a bit simpler, it only has three stages, but there's still some complexity there as well. And this is where, where it gets interesting perhaps for you guys. The idea was that, well, not everyone's going to be using DHS2, of course. Uh, we have Vigiflow also in the mix, which is a program used to send data up to the uh, global repository for vaccine safety. And the idea was that countries with a national DHS2 or other systems were going to have to be able to combine the data from those Sentinel sites and send it all into a, a PAHO repository, which is in yet a different system. Uh, and the idea was to use HL7, fire in the middle to make sure that everything was understood in there. Uh, and we still haven't got quite gotten there. Right now, they're doing imports. Uh, they're they're essentially sending CSVs into their uh, to their data warehouse. Uh, so we're not quite there yet, but we're very close. Uh, that's essentially how we have envisioned it to go. Currently, it's it's going a bit slower than we expected. Some country, most countries. They think that this is very important, of course, but when you look at the list of all the things they have to do, it's perhaps not the most urgent thing to suddenly start working on, especially now that the big drive for COVID vaccination has kind of died down. But there are more and more countries that are getting involved. Uh, Brazil and Paraguay are using it for, for in the Sentinel instance, or in the regional uh, DHS2 instance that Pajo has. Bolivia has approved their pilot, as well as Suriname, which I didn't put in there. Uh, and uh, Honduras also started working both with the Sentinel and with their national instance. In addition, we have Ecuador there who they looked at our metadata, they looked at Wapaho one and they're like, we're doing our own thing. So they have their own uh, configuration for uh, Esavi, which follows the guideline, but they have done themselves within the HS2. And the rest have, of course, a variety of other things. I think that more or less gives you an idea of what the 
what's going on in there. I don't know if there's any questions from you, Martin, or anything I missed. We're good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Right. In this case, they are all using individual data. So this is not aggregate data. They, they are essentially sending the cases directly, right? So they are not sending uh, any type of aggregated indicator into the repository. They're sending each case right there. Yeah. Yeah. So then the denominators more or less stay the same because we don't even deal with the denominators in the regional instance at all. I would. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, each person has a couple of unique identifiers, and that that's essentially used there. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that has been an issue that that, that we have considered that much. No. Uh, no, like it, it, this is tracker data. So one person has a profile, and then it's all linked to that person, essentially. Yeah, but but if the same person has multiple AFIs, they would be counted as different AFIs because we're looking at the AFIs in there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a mandate that pantries have to sign. It, this is, of course, they have to agree to do this, right? Uh, it's not like they can force them, but Paho does have, uh, you know, a repository for their data. Yeah. Yeah. Or should be pushing. Right now, it's more they're uploading <laughs> the CSVs. Right. I mean, the main the main thing is that what what's recording in VigiFlow is not necessarily the same that is being recorded in the HS2. The hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, and that's something that a lot of countries have requested. Right. We're gonna have to put it in VigiFlow anyway. Bring it back to us. Give us an XML that we can put in. Uh, and ideally that would happen, but it's just not part of the, the, the project scope. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good. Okay. So I'm just going to quite quickly now because of the time, uh, show you kind of the current status of the project. Um, let's see here. So, um, there's you no know, so, so what Paul has done, um, is basically, yeah, well, not Paul, but uh, I guess one of the, the HL7 organizations in Latin America, they have kind of been working with, with Paho and creating what's called a fire profile. So, basically, that's you, you can uh, compare it to I mean, this is to your metadata in kind of the way you kind of structure things and saying this is required, this is required, and uh, so on. And then they're using something called a questionnaire. Um, questionnaire, which is like a very basic um, fire type for collecting data. And then you're sending back a questionnaire response to that, that questionnaire. Um, so the approach we have taken is more or less exactly what we have gone through right now. You will see if you're starting with the root itself. Uh, it's a little bit more complex this time, as we are also doing a bit of prefetching. So, um, <clears throat> 
for example, we want to, so of course, as you know, in tracker data, you have the data element and you have the value, right? But that value is just a code and you might want a name for that. Uh, so you want to reverse it, right? So you want to take the code, convert it back to the name or, or, or maybe a translation. So we're kind of prefetching a few things here. So we can use that as a reverse lookup table, basically. So you can go, go, go back from very, very, very rare. And uh, we do this particularly two things. One is the who drug, which is uh, basically a huge terminology list of uh, drugs and, and of course, including the vaccines. And we do the MEDRA, a MEDRA is a classification system for AFA cases. So if you have a skin rash or you have a high temperature or something, they will have a code for that in the MEDRA. So that's why we're kind of prefetching that. Um, except for that, you will see something very familiar here. Um, if you go down to the actual actual router that does the fetching, um, we basically just setting again, we have, we have a specific program in this just two. We say oh, the organism wanted to be accessible. That means that give me whatever I have access to. Uh, in this case, we just do one page size. We, we don't, uh, this uh, demo server doesn't have too much data. So we, that's why we kind of hard coded it to be a bit specific. And we actually had a connected tone in, um, in um, Bogota, uh, Colombia. Uh, and then we did some exercises there. So we're kind of using those exercises as a way of getting the data and transform it. So we have a kind of pre-made uh, examples. So this is not real, this is not, not the real data I'm going to show you. Um, and then we have, of course, the field filtering. We have not very specific here. Uh, we will, of course, update that to be a bit more uh, strict later on. But again, here, here we're doing the very simple stuff, resource, extract into the instances. And of course, I remember now, this is the legacy importer. So this is using the track entity instances. In the new one, you would use tracker, right? So not in the new one, it's uh, in, the, in the current one. <laughs> um, and then we don't really do much, we, we are just, in this case, we are not using the generated classes. Uh, we've been a bit more specific. So we have created um, some uh, some classes using uh, Lombok, which is kind of gives us a very quick way of, of generating uh, DTO classes. Um, so we're just converting it back to that. And we have a convert body and we just look at that. That's kind of what's doing the actual work. And, <clears throat> and then we just saying we want fire version four out, out of that. And we are also exposing a questionnaire response uh, and endpoint. So you will see how that works. Of course, uh, in this case, we, we could of course also have sent to a fire server but we don't have it like kind of, and we don't really have an active fire server right now that kind of we can be using for this. So we are just exposing it to the API, but that, that's coming definitely soon. So in this case, so the, the start of the converter is quite similar to what you saw before. Um, this is kind of doing all the magic. You look, look at that, but it's basically just wrapping things um, uh, in, in, in a bundle as we did before, the, the entire case as a questionnaire response. And you can have one case or many, in this case, we just have one, but you can have many, 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 many cases. Okay. So we are doing, okay, I should be done in four minutes. So this is, uh, I'm not gonna go through this one. Uh, there's quite a lot, but the, the basic building blocks are exactly the same, right? We saw before you create a bundle, in this case, we are not creating locations and organizations. We are creating questionnaire responses. And we are, so these classes are not something I made. This is all coming from the Happy Fire Cloud Library. It makes it very quick and unnatural to, to, to create them. Although some of them can be a bit wordy. You can see that it has some really long, long ones. Um, questionnaire response, questionnaire response item component, for example. Um, but it's, it's still a nice way of doing it. And, and it kind of helps you with not if you do any misspelling or anything like that, that you kind of don't have to worry about, um, which is can be positive, it can be negative. And I know that data's on it, probably this code will be smaller, but you will still have to do with the processing of the data. So, yeah. So this is kind of the, the, the way of um, just doing it. And of course, in this case, um, the actual, what we're just turning is actually in, in Spanish. So that's, uh, that's why we have a little Spanish in, in, this, uh, in this file. <laughs> But yeah, it, it, it is quite a lot. 
Um, I probably should <laughs> split this up at some point. It's over 1,000 lines right now, but it will be much, much more when it's done, I think. Um, but you see the general approach is the same, right? That's the kind of the point. Um, you're just using the DCS2 Java uh, uh, camel component, getting data for DCS2, using a type converter, and we are uh, exposing a, an, an endpoint. And if I wanted to send it to fire, it would be one line, right? That's how easy it is to, to, to change it. So let's start this up. Hopefully the server is behaving. Yeah, they're all linked in the in the in the, the presentation. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> all right. So then we have a couple of Postman URLs here. So I just wanted to show you. This is actually the same. Oh, yeah. This is actually the same URL that is now being constructed for me inside of the Java. So I just want to show you that it's, it's no magic here. We're just using the API. And this is, of course, just normal DCS2 uh, data. Um, but of course, the point was to transform it. And we have now exposed an, an endpoint here, slash fire base R4 questionnaire response. So what it's doing now, in the background again, it will go to DCS2, get it into Camel, convert it completely into fire compatible um, JSON, and then expose that directly uh, as an endpoint. You know, you see that that worked fine. So now you will see it, it has all of this stuff <laughs> it has generated. Of course, it's not something you normally would want to generate yourself. So this is why we have this very nice Happy Fire library that allows us to kind of generate these things and make sure that it, it is, is fine. Um, so yeah, so this this is, again, this is the approach we're kind of recommending now. Uh, this is a very simple way of putting a facade on DHS2, and you can expose many other um, APIs if you want. And of course, again, you can also send it to DHS2, or you can do whatever you want with it. So that's definitely, definitely a recommended approach. Um, and and you're kind of you're kind of get, getting the, the power of um, you get every handling and everything for free, right? So so that's kind of nice. Uh, I think we need to stop there. I think we need to go over now to the next use case, uh, which is Tofik. Sure, sure, sure. Sort of extractable. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Oh no 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 no. This is this is not, this is nothing. No no no. This is um. It, it, it's just a very, very simple questionnaire that they have created. Um, it does have some links for terminologies and so on, but they, no, they, it has, it, it's yeah, it's kind of implicit by the, the questionnaire response itself what, what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we, we we have not created those those uh, questionnaire. It, I wouldn't call it a profile. I don't think people like call questionnaires profiles, but it's um, but it's basically well, well, they have, we have, we have kind of gotten that format for us. This is why it's in Spanish. I, I would not have selected Spanish if, uh, if I was creating that profile, that uh, questionnaire. Questionnaire. Okay, Tofik, are you ready? Hi everyone. Yeah, we want to share about the Indonesia interoperability journey, especially in Indonesia. We talk about the integration and interoperability. This is the process what we uh, doing right now, especially how to use the this is two fire and how to uh, build the ecosystem in Indonesia. So I want to share something about the uh, this is two in Indonesia. Since 2016, we implement this as two, especially for the data aggregations. You can see the 
the use case from the our uh, paper here how to develop the information from the data integration into data aggregation and how to use it into dashboard in 2029 and 2020 especially uh we use this as two and transform to individual data record it's meant to escalate the information to uh, use for the contact tracing COVID-19 and the total number of the users is around uh, 700, uh, 700 active users every day. This is the, our difficulty to use this as two because you know the result is very, very big and the most is, is about the cost. And uh, we transform based on the COVID-19 2021 our ministers established the new office we call it like digital transformation office i just you already recognize this information and uh, this information to use the individual data for every activities not only to use the information from the aggregate one so we have the struggle how to use this as two as the aggregate and how to utilize the individual data from the many perspective of the information here so in this information, we can see the information about the, this is two is still running currently for the malaria. Uh, we received support from uh, development partners here and we uh, established information for the malaria use case, individual data exactly here. And now it's for the national dashboard currently, this is the aggregate one. So what does that mean? The implementation of the, this is two is currently transformed to the, Satu Sehat, we call it here. You can see from dto.kemcast.go.id and we can share the information about the Satu Sehat implementation. This is the current condition of the this is two Satu Sehat, fire and everything is must be uh, combined and mixed into these uh, conditions. Uh, so what is the motivations here? From Indonesia, especially from our minister, he want to see the information not only on the aggregate because we have the struggle how to merge and how to reduce the information, data capture, data collection in many applications. And based on the situation, we, we made a survey, especially a lot of application at national level, 400 applications uh, to get to collect the data from the individual data source. So this is the information. He hoped from the beginning of the cycles, we can get the individual attribute, individual uh, case, and individual uh, service to use the information for the aggregate one. So we establish the information, something like this, but you can see the most important here from Indonesia. Previously, many years ago, we share information about the Indonesia, and we mentioned about thousands of highlands but now we can see healthcare facility currently you can see right number here more than active numbers health industries and data is not only from the aggregate it must be from the uh, individual we establish the fire here and nationally and the second we establish the standardization for medical standard we cannot utilize from the our perspective we embed ICD-10, ICD-9, clinical uh, modifications, Nomad City, Loing, and Dicom. Currently, we uh, we already success and sorry to, to buy or subscribe the Nomad City national implementation here. And we embed the service, especially because like uh, health facility master data for the patients. We optimize with the master patient index facility. We hold with the facility registry health worker registry, pharmacy device and equipment, health cost and service. So this is the important what we currently doing. And the next uh, good things from Indonesia, uh, this is not only about the technicals, but also the regulation we established four things here. The platform is like the regulation on medical record establishment. Uh, the application, if you Remember about the one application from Indonesia because like Pedul Lindungi Satu Sehat Mobile this is the part of this area. 
standardization, research and policy. This is the regulation we uh, we can support for the implementation. This is the part of the uh, Indonesia. So how we establish the fire? In Indonesia, we establish fires not for the only implementation. We start from the development phase. This is for individual data. You can see, I can see later. So we implement the seven step of the implement development phase. One is about define the use case here because uh, we have the limited resources. Previously, since COVID-19, we only have three persons has the expert this on fire. So that's why we start from the defining the use case. We start the simple uh, EMR, inpatient, outpatients, and based the another uh, use case of the health program. For example, the TB case management, TB uh, supply chain, and malaria, for example, and we go to the MNH situation. And the second part, we assess the variable. It means we know from the beginning, from the from the beginning of variables, we have to observe. This is the same attribute or same element must be contribute for another uh, application or another program. We have to establish, and we have to assess on this. And the third is to establish or to create the fire profile. A lot of applications uh, we receive the invitation from like the. Uh, the subscription application for something, but the cost and uh, the person is only three persons. So that's why you use the Google Sheet to modify or something here. And the file, the second, st the sorry, the next step is about technical guidance. We establish on the simplifier because like implementation guidance here about the how to develop and how to utilize Postman, how to utilize web API bundle or for example here. Testing, this is the step. Testing is how we establish the testing. We create the champion. We uh, make a relationship with the university research center for Indonesia, and we, cal we calculate how many persons must be uh, receive the, the training for the Satu uh, Sehat for fire, for example. This is the concept of this champion here. And next is the review. We make a recycle again and publish to the simplifier for uh, for another reasons. So this is the sample. You can see from our simplifier. This is the published version. So that's why if research center, if the hospital want to establish the fire instance, they can copy the metadata. That they can manually copy and also they can uh, allocate their uh, resources to offer some revision, to offer some suggestion uh, to the national team. So how about the HIPS Indonesia? Uh, to support Satu Sehat or to support uh, FIRE on Indonesia, we establish application, we call it like Jumpa Doctor. There are a lot of applications from Indonesia, but why we use the Jumpa Doctor here? One is, we want to establish this is two for the individual data. So this is the part of the implementation and the motivation here. We establish Jumpa Doctor, uh, web dashboard, user patient, they can uh, download from Android, uh, iOS, for example, and also uh, the medical doctor or the healthcare, they can uh, use the web dashboard here. This is the Jumpa Doctor is based on this is two tracker, and we want, and we establish the connection to Satu Sehat Nationals implementation. And we copy the metadata from Simplifier directly. And how to uh, utilize, especially from, uh, from this is two. This is a, the simple, uh, this is the simple uh, method. We, map, we make a mapping effort especially from this is two to the resource fire especially like the patients, organization or uh, organizations, even to diagnose, even to another uh, service, for example, we utilize this area. And the next is very important. Uh, we can share our resource from status from the Jumpa Doctor tracker to another applications. 
this is not only this is two to the fire, but also we can replicate to another uh, application what we have in Indonesia. So this is the pine, especially for fire. This is the process and how we store it uh, into that area. I think it's, you know, over to Morton. This is my slide. I think it's, yes. Yes. Yeah, the mobile apps for the developer. API directly. The the API uh, uh we utilize the this is too as the core of uh mobile apps. So we utilize the only user interface and the APIs directly to the, our instance. This is to instance. Yeah. Uh, not written again. Because uh, the one thing is because the national fires uh, server is not allowable to get data previously, but now uh, due to the ethics, due to the privacy, for example, we want to establish the privacy. And you can you can see the uh, the address uh, the address of fire for Indonesia. This is national's implementation right now. Yep. I need to press it. Thank you. Thank you, Morton. Thank you, Taufik. Um, this is Morton's slide. <laughs> um, it's just a, a, a way for us really just to engage a little bit with you guys in terms of what some of our thinking is on how to plan the year ahead um and an opportunity to get some feedback some critique it's always great watching martin give a presentation he takes the men and women and separates them from the boys and girls and they leave the room early and, uh, <laughs> so we're left with the serious people and yearn um but yeah this is the way we've been thinking about our roadmap, we want to finalize it in the next week or two. Um, but just highlights tentatively. I guess the first point is just the boring stuff, just taking some of the things we've already been doing, getting everything up updated. Um, some of you have heard about this open API specification that's been worked on by the DHS2 core team. I think one of the benefits of the core team developing this open API is that it opens up lots of possibilities. Um, from an integration perspective, even in terms of interrogating the API and being a bit smarter. Uh, the webhooks or webhooks, we're not allowed to say webhooks, event hooks, um, new feature in the core. I think for a long time, something that people have been asking for, for forever is um, how can we listen to something that's going on within the DHIS2? I mean, think about the API, it sits there. I, you know, I like to use the analogy of ice cream. All right? You have all these systems that sit there exposing APIs, but they're passive. They just sit there. You need to have something that's going to lick the ice cream. right? And that's usually what your, your middleware does. But if you have no way of actually listening to events, it means that you're doing things like polling, checking every five minutes. Is there a new org unit now, for example? Is there a new patient enrollment? It's nice very useful it's not just about being nice it's very useful to have the ability to be able to to register yourself as a listener to to events that take place within dhis2 um, i don't think it replaces polling sometimes it complements polling because the thing about things like webhooks is that sometimes they can fail so it's still useful to have a polling cycle to clean up 
But anyway, this is new functionality that exists within the within the core. And we want to make it just really, really easy for people if they're using the, the Apache Camel component, for example, that they can really easy take advantage of, of the new event hook functionality. The kind of things you can do, I think you say we have a Kafka target, for example. So you can register interest in something like uh, a new org unit has been created or a change in an org unit and just get that placed onto a queue. And then you decouple the problem with someone else's um, concern to decide how they're going to dequeue that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that's a big part of our roadmap. Uh, the other thing that's come into core is this root, root API thing. Um, yeah, I mean, even, even if we look at our camel components ourselves, particularly when you look at some of the examples that Morton showed there where, the, where he's written a camel route that actually exposes an API itself. Um, ideally, we want to be able to route all of those APIs through a common kind of gateway. It starts to go a little bit long into the territory of open him, you know, eh? and that's sort of what open him does to a certain extent is is um, routing to different backend components. Yeah, then the integration middleware itself. I should make the point about this, um, that this is kind of opinionated, right? And not everybody loves Camel. In fact, I don't even love Camel. Um, I recognize that it's really, really powerful and you can do some really good stuff with it. But people are also doing really, really good stuff with with Node.js, um, not so much, to be honest, but um, uh, Python, we've seen some, I think we're gonna see some examples on on Wednesday of some of the work that, that Wahit has done within Waho on, again, based on a completely different framework using Apache Airflow. So the point is there are many frameworks out there, but we just wanted to pick on one so that we can we can build it out in such a way that someone can take it and and work with it. The penny dropped, I guess, about two years ago. I mean, we sort of had an integration team for years, and we spent a lot of time talking amongst ourselves and and within Oslo and maybe to some selected partners. The penny dropped about two years ago that we don't do most of the integration. Most of the integration happens out there. Um, and in fact, it's often it's our it's our own HISP groups. Um, I would say our own, but uh, our our HISP network. Um, a lot of the integration is happening out there. So rather than us trying to solve all the integration problems in the world, we thought one of the best things we could do is let's make a really robust toolkit that people can take up and use. So nobody's obliged to take it up and use it, but it's useful for folk to know that. Um, it's under active development. Um, we take sort of full ownership of it. And the nice thing on basing, basing it on something like Apache Camel is that it's not a Mickey Mouse thing, right? This is, this is used in the financial industry and in the airline booking stuff. It's used, I think it's used in the National Health Service. I've seen Camel running. Even some of our friends over in OpenMRS have made a OpenMRS Camel component. So um, I'm actually looking forward to getting together with them and joining our camels together. But yeah, we're gonna continue building and strengthening the tooling that's there. The kind of strengthening we wanna do, we wanna build in a few things. I mean, what we have at the moment is really quite interesting website if you're, or, or code repository, if you're into that kind of thing of lots of Java code snippets and examples. The idea being people can take some of those, like Vlad wants to now go and study study examples. People should be able to take those and build their own. And I think that's still the, that's still the intent and the hope, but I think we also want to, to build in a little bit more functionality that comes out of the box. So it's not just a, a very fine-grained Lego set, but there's some big pieces of Lego as well. Uh, and one of the one of the functionalities that we know, it's been, again, it's been a requirement for many years. Uh, the, 
supposedly simple problem of synchronizing organization units, right? And you get into facility registry discussions and things like that. Uh, we know that whether we like it or not, people will use DHS2, particularly the aggregate HMIS system, as their de facto facility registry. Or even if they have another one, they will feed that from the HMIS system. So we need to do a little bit of a better job in making it easier for people to take systems like that and um, synchronize org units um, in other DHS2 instances of it. Or if you go some other route like, like Morton was showing, even converting some of those things into fire bundles that systems other than DHIS2 might also be able to read off it. Providing beans. Okay, now we're getting back into deep stuff. <laughs> uh, Morton was showing your roots using Java code. And Java is a really powerful language for, for writing these kind of things. But sometimes it's kind of a little bit hard to customize it on site, right? You might you might have a, a an integration route which meets 95% of, of people's functionality, but there's a little 5% that you need to change. Um, I don't know if you showed any example, I don't think you did, of, of Camel routes using other domain specific languages, other DSLs. Java is not the only way to write routes in 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 Camel. It's the most it's the most powerful one, but it's not necessarily the most customizable one. And if we expose particularly hard things, do that in Java, then it's possible for people to configure routes using YAML is a popular language for configuring routes. Uh, XML has been there for a long time. The point is, these things are just text. You can you can declare write those routes and customize them without recompiling any code, um, and make use of Java beans which have been declared to do some of the heavy lifting for you. Ah, and that was the next point on the slides. I only read one point at a time. I didn't get... Um. Yeah, the other thing is, again, from what you saw was what a, basically like scripts running at the back end. Um, well, these can be really powerful scripts. I don't think we got into a lot of the detail in terms of the things you can configure with Camel, like like um, uh, like HTTP failure detection, exponential back off, dead letter queues, be very, very flexible error, error and logging, um, dealing with concurrency. You might have a particular part of the route that's, that works fine, and then another part of the route that's actually really slow. So you can make that part of the route multi-threaded, for example. Um, lots of powerful things that you can do, um, but it's all just still back-end scripts at the end of the day. And um, we know that in most cases, even if it's a back-end integration engine, uh, people are going to want to have some kind of user interface on top of it to be able to start things off, stop things, examine errors. Again, if people are, are familiar with OpenHIM, some of the kinds of functionalities that you see in OpenHIM, um, um, not trying to replicate it exactly, but trying to think through what's the kind of user interface features that people are looking for. We didn't get the chance to show off Hortio. That's something else you can you can Google. It's there in the diagram at Hortio on the top. That's a really nice kind of um, metrics front end that you can really dig into your camel context and you can see things like how many messages per second, how many failures. Um, you can start and stop things. Uh, but it's still it's a little bit of a geeky kind of interface. It's it's not really a user interface for normal human being users. Okay, and then of course there's fire. Um, it's interesting, you know, we put out this call for abstracts. Um, and we particularly said we were interested in abstracts on, on integration and interoperability and architecture. And I think we only got one. I reviewed about 43 of them. Um, horrible job. Well, not really. I mean, there were some really in, there were some really interesting ones, but there was there were there was too many of them. Um, and only one of them mentioned fire, and that was Taufik's one. Um, that's kind of interesting. Um, but 
we do know that there's a there's a significant interest out there, um, the significant demand. It's um, maybe not coming very directly from the community that we we immediately dealing with, but it's somewhere on the periphery. So uh, we've been working over the past year or two, or longer, I guess. People might remember a couple of years back, probably about 2019. Um, oh, I'm nearly, I'm nearly out of time. I better move faster than that. What are we going to do with fire? Yeah, basically trying to do the simple things. Um, we can already do quite a lot of simple things, but again, they're all just snippets and examples. We need to put it together and we should be able to kind of download the DHIS to uh, CAMEL-based integration engine, which will have all of these things baked into it. Um, some of this other stuff is, is related to detail. A really interesting thing that's emerged this year is trying to turn the problem around. Sometimes it's quite hard to figure out, well, somebody's giving you all of these, these complicated fire profiles from WHO smart guidelines or whatever they might be. They can be quite hard to map to DHS too, but we can do it the other way. But we can also take whatever's in DHS too and export that as, as fire profiles to make them more easily consumable. Um, and that's me. Alice. <laughs> good afternoon. Welcome. Good, I'm good. How are you? Okay. All right, we are time up. We have a minute. Um, sorry for taking a long time over the roadmap, but that's the roadmap. Um, we're, I'm easy to get hold of if you have comments or suggestions or inputs to it is just bob at dhs2.org or morton at dhs2.org we're really interested in some whatever thoughts and inputs and what it is that you think we should be doing all right yeah yeah i was very worried i was going to catch fire putting this thing on my head but it's, it seemed to be all right. Good.